Hey there, LDS music enthusiast. Welcome. Today we're looking at hymn number 1004 in the newly released selections from the new LDS hymnal. It's a lovely primary song called I Will Walk With Jesus by Steve Shank. One of the main features of this song is a bass line that often walks up and down the scale as it moves from chord to chord in a very gentle way. This doesn't happen 100% of the time in the song, but it happens enough to give the song a feel of a step-by-step -step kind of journey as we sing about walking with Jesus through our lives. I'm going to highlight five excellent writing techniques that I hope will help you as you work on your next piece of sacramenting music. Technique number one, internal melodic lines. As you can see here at the very beginning, we mostly have a four-part piano layering. It's almost like SATB writing for piano. You can see that in the left hand we have bass notes, and then we have stem up in the left hand, which is like our tenor. And then in the right hand, we have the top line, which is like a soprano. And then we have some stem down lines as well, which act as sort of an alto line. This is a really lovely way to write simplified piano parts. When you're writing a primary song, that's one of the most difficult things, is getting the, the richness of harmony that you're going for, but in a way that makes it still easy to play. And that can be quite a challenge. Uh, one of the ways to do this easier piano writing is to keep most of your music in musical, in, in, in chord blocks. So that on the strong beats, like beats one and three, there's a blocked chord, and then the melody is played above it. That's like bare minimum, having blocked chord with a melody over it and no other motion. Sometimes that's a really great way to do things, especially if the tempo is faster, because you don't really have time to do a bunch of internal motion if it's a fast tempo. But in a medium or slow tempo, there's plenty of time to have little additions happening between the blocked chords that are played on strong beats. And if you can do those little motions between chords in a very lyrical way, it adds a nice uh, melodic layering. So here at the very beginning, we start with the introduction tune. Now look at that first measure. They could have just done, but there's an alto. three blind mice sound. It's a small example, but it really does change the feel and the, the texture of the music. It's almost like a painting where a Van Gogh where the texture comes off the canvas a little bit. You can hear more texture in a piece like this. It adds to the richness of your piano writing. There are several other places throughout the song where he does this, but I just wanted to point it out here at the beginning so you could see how nicely that can work. Also, just as a side note, I've noticed several changes in this version of the song from when it came out in The Friend a couple of years ago, and it's been improved quite a bit. It was beautiful before. It had a few little kind of less than great moves here and there with voice leading, um, but all of those are, are now fixed, and it's really working beautifully. I really I like how it's working. There's one spot I'm going to make a suggestion on, but we'll get to that soon. Technique two, feeding singers their first note. One of the most important parts of any primary song, and many other types of pieces of music as well, is making sure that the accompanying instruments can provide help to the singers to get their first note. And this is even more important in a situation where you're teaching music by rote, which we do in our church with the primary children. The kids are not holding sheets of music. They're learning by rote, by ear. So if the piano part can lead them to find their first note, that will help them a ton. And in fact, this is one of the things that's different than the previous version that was in the friend. In the previous version, it didn't give them their first note in the most successful way, but it's been 
it's been worked out here. It's, it works quite well. So the kids start on the same note that the accompaniment starts on. But they still need some help. So they just heard it again. Now that note hangs in the air. It's now resolved. It needs to resolve. In this case, it resolves back up. Another way to do that would have been to pause on the E flat instead of the C. We have a five chord there right before the kids sing. And if you, you know, the, the C is a good choice because it steps to the D. However, there is a connotation of the C wanting to go down to B flat because that's tonic. Another way to do this, which might be even stronger, would be to have the piano pause on E flat. Because the E flat almost has no choice but to go down to D. But I think the reason they didn't do that is because we just had a bunch of repeated E flats right before. They'd have to go. So I think he made the right choice. And, you know, the context is everything. There's principles, there's, there's rules, so-called, which, you know, uh, Rules change and times change, and I like to learn and teach my students like the fundamental old school rules, so called, so they have a baseline to start with or a common denominator. But then, of course, music progresses, language progresses, and we can bend the rules here and there, and, and context is often a huge part of that. So, in this particular context, I think they made the right decision to pause on the C instead of the E-flat, given what's come before in uh, the piano accompaniment. Now, the same thing is important in a multiverse song when you get to the ending. You need to make sure that the turnaround to the next verse is also equally easy for them to find the note. In this case, they use the exact same chords uh, at the end of the first and second ending, which then feeds the kids their first note again. So very well done. One last spot that I want to point out here is at the start of the chorus. So each new section can have a lead in to the melody note. It's always helpful to, to string their ear along to feed them the melody note. And the melody note at the start of the chorus here, as I walk with Jesus, is a climactic note. It's the high, I believe it's the highest note so far. Let's double check. Um, yep, it's the highest note so far, and it may not even return ever again. Do we get another D? We get another D in measure 15 there on change. But that's a, you know, that's a big note. And what they do is they lead our ear right to it. In fact, it's the exact same lead-in as the introduction, but an octave higher. And when you think about the energy spaces of a verse and a chorus, typically the energy increases at the end of the verse to let it blossom at the beginning of the chorus. So to have the verse pause on this tendency tone, the second scale to grace C, meaning it wants to resolve, and have it resolve up to the climactic note D feeds the kids the note very nicely. It's a, it's a great way to smoothly lead us along into the chorus. Technique three, protecting against resonance ruining motion. All right, let's talk for a minute about uh, what we call illegal parallel fifths and octaves. When we're writing in a style that's built on the old school Bach informed harmony, I find that it's usually best to adhere to his rules, so-called, of part writing, which means we want to avoid parallel fifths, going from a fifth to another fifth uh, directly. It's outside of the realm of that kind of writing. Now, again, context is everything. There are other contexts in other styles where parallel fifths are not only okay, 
they're sometimes really quite interesting. When Debussy, the great French composer, came along, he did a lot of things to sort of change uh, ways of writing. Now, the thing is, though, he used them in a very consistent way. When I write hymn arrangements for my wife and I to play, she's a great violinist, and I play the piano to accompany her, I very often borrow from styles of great composers like Debussy, and so you can find many examples in my string arrangements where I use these parallel fifths and octaves on purpose in the style of Debussy because I'm writing in that context. When we're writing in this context and we're using a pretty traditional style of writing, I personally find that it's best to stay consistent with the general rules of that style. Of course, there's always times when we can play with and bend those. But I want to draw your attention to a couple of spots that were done really cleverly to avoid those illegal parallels. The first one here is in measure four. As you can see, the left hand starts on a fifth. We have the uh, the F and the tenor and the B flat in the bass. Well, look at the next bass notes. It's another fifth. Now, if that fifth had been played together on beat three, then we would have a pretty blatant parallel fifth of B flat to F, C to D. That's totally against the traditional Bach style of writing, which this hymn is firmly built upon. Now, there's a few differences where we have some newer techniques here, but generally speaking, the context of this song is adhering to those rules of Bach. So we want to continue that throughout. And uh, Steve Shank did a great job of avoiding this parallel with a very simple rhythm trick. Instead of moving to the C on beat three, he just delayed it. C, D. That gets rid of the parallel fifth just by staggering rhythmically. That's something Bach did all the time to avoid that kind of writing. Because in the style of the Bach writing, the sort of the old school traditional hymn style, those fifths kind of suck out the resonance from what has been going on around it in that context. Again, context is everything. So the second one of these we want to look at is in measure 10. And this um, this was is now different than the original uh, version that came out in the friend a while ago. It used to have a C right here in the tenor. And when it did, it had a f perfect fifth going to a perfect fifth on consecutive strong beats, which was another sort of illegal in the in this traditional style parallel fifth. But he changed it, and I really like how he changed it. It was a very nice way to still include the C, because the C is in the melody, but to do it in a way that avoids the parallel. And the way he did it was he... Uh, went from a four-voice texture here to a three-voice, well, it's really still four voices, but the the this voice came up here so that the left hand is now free of that fifth. The left hand has a two-part tenor bass and then kind of goes bass only. So we shuffle the voicing doublings uh, from two voices in the left hand and two voices in the right hand to one voice in the left hand and three voices in the right hand, and that clears out the parallel fifth. It was really well done. Now, there's one last spot I want to bring to your attention, and it's in measure 13. This one, it's it's a bit sneaky. I'm being a little bit maybe over the top here, but I just want to bring it up in case you find yourself in this situation and you want to, to fix it. Okay. Again, context is everything. You may disagree with the context idea that I have about this being built on traditional harmony, but let me show you what you would do to fix it. Okay. So what's happening is when we're on beat one, we have a nice octave and then when we get to beat two, that octave is now turned into a fifth, G and D.
we're hearing that fifth, and then on the very next beat, we get another perfect fifth. So we get that's parallel fifths. And in the context of this traditional writing, it's an illegal move. How do we fix it? Well, in this case, it's actually a pretty easy fix. <clears throat> we're on that fifth G, D. We can have the tenor, instead of the tenor going up to G, we can have the tenor step down to C as the bass steps up to C. They can have a moment of unison, and then the tenor jumps up to G after that. This works really well. So if you're in a situation like this where a parallel fifth kind of snuck up on you like this, try to take one of the voices in the opposite direction to see if you can clear it out. Technique four, making verse and chorus similar enough, yet different enough. When we're writing a song or hymn or any kind of a piece that has a verse and a chorus, we want there to be something different about the chorus that we don't find in the verse so that it's Interesting. So we're not just listening to the same thing over and over again. Uh, the, the element of change and surprise and variation is, is the essence of composition. However, if that new section, the chorus section, is too contrasting, sometimes it feels like it doesn't belong in the same piece. It might feel like a totally different piece. This particular song does a really good job. It's a very conservative approach to making the chorus a little bit different than the verse, but still it's in the same kind of feel, but it's, it's just enough. So here's what happens. At the very beginning of the first measure of the singing, we get the one chord, going to the four chord in second inversion, and then coming back to the one chord in root position. And the note starts on D. Now, when we get to the chorus down here in measure 11, we get the same exact chords in those uh, in that first measure. We get the B flat chord, and we get the E flat second inversion chord. The it's different now because the tune's higher, but it's the exact same chord configuration. But what happens next is a different move. Originally, in the verse, the B flat stayed on beat one, on beat three, and then in the next measure as well. Not anymore here. So we get, first of all, same chords, which make it feel like it's part of the same piece. Yet, we have a different melodic shape. We have reached our first climactic high note, and the tune is now pointing downward instead of pointing upward. So that's a difference. And then the second difference is that the bass goes in a different direction now. Back in the verse, if you track the bass line, it plays a couple B flats in a row, and then it starts to go up the scale. Not here in the chorus. Now it starts to go down the scale. Down. Up. Down. Down. Okay? So it's almost the same. Same chords for the first measure, slightly different tune with a different direction and with a climactic note, but then where it goes next is different, which helps us. That, that creates the sense of variation and newness without yanking it out and making it sound like a different song. So that's very well done here. Technique five, avoiding classical voice leading potholes. Here we are in the chorus, and there's a potentially dangerous moment here. This goes back to those rules of traditional writing, that when you have two chords right next to each other, two adjacent chords, and they're both in root position, and the bass is stepping, you're in a situation where you could make a big error. So let me point this out to you here. We have this chord. Uh, it's a little bright. We have this C minor 7 chord in root position going to a D dominant 7 chord in root position. Okay, So two 
root position chords in a row on strong beat, consecutive strong beats. The bass is stepping. That's a situation born for disaster. <clears throat> because look what happens. Let me zoom in a tad. Right here in the alto, we also have that C. If the composer had not used this note, then that C would have gone directly to a D, while this C also went directly up to a D. Parallel octaves. That's against the old school traditional Bach rules that this song is mostly based on. But the composer did a very clever little thing to avoid that problem. There's actually a couple of ways to avoid this problem. The most common way to avoid this problem is that, again, if you have two root position chords next to each other and the bass is stepping, the easiest way is to take the other voices and have them step in the opposite direction. That solves any of these issues. But we can't do that in this situation because the melody is going up. So instead of having the upper voices go contrary motion to the stepping bass, the composer takes the chord, the first chord in question, and before he resolves it, he inverts it so that no longer do we have the two root position chords in a row. He leaps up from the C up to the E flat and then down to the D, which creates that nice contrary motion with the alto and gets rid of the illegal parallel octave. So it's a great technique. So keep your eye out for moments where you have two root position chords next to each other and the bass is stepping. That's a dangerous spot. It's probably the most common writing error I see with my students as they're learning the basics of writing. So what is my opinion of this hymn? I think it's a beautiful song and a beautiful message. And the music is filled with harmonies that create those kind of warm feelings that we want the kids to have as they sing about walking with Jesus. I think the primary kids will love getting the chance to sing this in sacrament meeting. It's become very familiar to most of them. And they'll, their ears will perk up, that's for sure, and they will sing. Uh, if you enjoyed this and if you'd like to download the harmonic analysis that I've created on that score you saw a minute ago, you can go to the link down in the description box. It's a free download, uh, no strings attached, and you can do a little more study and see where the chords are moving uh, to help you as you work on your own music. Be sure to watch the next video in this series of new LDS hymnal reviews. In the next one, we're going to look at hymn 1005, His Eye is on the Sparrow. I'll see you then.